Well, good afternoon. We'd like to welcome you all to Stay Cur Curious for the American Space Museum. Uh, I'm your host today, Nick Thomas. Uh, Mark Marquette is not with us. Uh, Mark uh, is in Las Vegas. He's doing four shows a night at the uh, Copa Room at the Sands Hotel. So if you're out there, be sure to go by and see him. No, Mark is actually in Findlay, Ohio, watching the eclipse with his mother, who, God bless her, is 91 years old. So Mark and Mom, happy eclipse. We hope you had a good view of it, and we hope you're having a good time out there. Uh, we've got, a, I think, an interesting show for you today. We're going to talk about a couple of things. Uh, one thing we're going to talk about, and it's a topic that's come up recently quite often at the uh, uh, Chat with an Astronaut uh, event over at the Space Center. People are asking, do astronauts still drive Corvettes? Well, some of them do, but they're not getting the deals that the original Mercury 7 got. We're going to talk about not only that deal and the man behind it, but also tell you about some of the great stories behind those Corvettes and uh, some of the unofficial races that occurred uh, uh, on uh, Cape Canaveral. Uh, also, today we're going to talk about a great legend in the uh, American space program. Not an astronaut, not a flight director, not a mission controller, but a photographer for Life magazine. A great man, and we're going to talk, tell you about him, and we're going to share some of his work today. Uh, we also want to tell you about uh, an event coming up here in town called Shuttle Fest 3. Uh, that's going to be here in Titusville. It's uh, scheduled for Saturday, April the uh, 13th at the uh, uh, Hyatt Place here in Titusville. Uh, our special guest that day is going to be astronaut John David Bartow. And John David is going to uh, share some stories with you. We're going to have a lot of great panels uh, during the day. Also a lot of great vendors with their uh, 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 supplies and their uh, trade. So please be sure to come by and visit us out at uh, Shuttle Fest 3 uh, this coming Saturday at the uh, Hyatt Place uh, in Titusville. Uh, a good time will be, uh, will be had by all. Now, as I mentioned earlier, one of the people we're going to talk about today is a gentleman who was a, uh, a legend in the space business. And as I say, he was not an astronaut or a uh, uh, flight controller or flight director. He was a photographer, and his name was Ralph Morse. Now, Ralph was the chief photographer for Life magazine. And of course, uh, during the 1960s, Life magazine had the contract for the uh, astronauts' personal storage for the Mercury 7 astronauts. And that contract actually extended all the way through the Apollo program. So not only were the reporters of Life magazine going to have exclusive uh, access to the astronauts and to the program, but Ralph was going to be the photographer. And his job was to take photos not only of the training, not only of the equipment and the rockets, but also to be with the astronauts in their day-to-day -day lives, photographing uh, them in moments of leisure, photographing them with their family. And we're going to uh, uh, review some of uh, Ralph's images uh, today. Uh, first, a few uh, items about Ralph's background. He was born in Manhattan and raised in a very tough neighborhood in the Bronx. His interest in photography actually started in high school. And uh, he actually carried out his first assignment with a borrowed camera. He went on to uh, uh, gain steady work uh, with uh, different magazines. He worked for Harper's Bazaar, but only for one day because uh, he said that he couldn't understand taking pictures that meant nothing to anyone outside of the women's fashion industry. Eventually, uh, he served as a uh, war correspondent during World War II, both in the Pacific and European theaters. He was the youngest war correspondent, 24 years old at the time. And uh, among other things, Ralph was on board the USS Vincennes when it was sunk. Uh, he lost all of his camera equipment, all of his gear, all of his film. He spent the night treading water while destroyers around him were dropping depth charges, trying to find these Japanese submarines. And in typical, typical understatement, Ralph said, well, the depth charges were a good thing because they scared away all the barracuda and the shark. Uh, he, uh, after the war, he spent uh, time living in Paris, covering the reconstruction of Europe after World War II, and then eventually uh, covered the United States space program for Life magazine, uh, of course, uh, starting with the Mercury program in Cape Canaveral. And we're going to show you some examples of, uh, of his work, some of the things he's done, some of the things he's known for, and some of the things you may not recognize. So 
let's start off with the uh, first one. Uh, this is the pool at the Holiday Inn in Cogo Beach, and this is Deke Slayton ostensibly diving into the swimming pool. Well, he's diving because he's been pushed. Uh, Ralph was part of this gag, and he drew Deke out to the back to the uh, to the pool for what was supposed to be a photo shoot, and naturally the guys shoved him into the uh, into the water. And with typical good humor and good grace, Deke laughed it off. That was a thing. If you were ever hit with a gotcha, you had to take it in stride because if you got upset, you were just going to be in for worse treatment maybe a week later. So here we see Deke uh, emerging from the uh, swimming pool uh, with uh, with a good grace and uh, even reading a, a letter after he got out of the, the swimming pool. So again, one of the uh, 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 classic... Uh, uh, gotchas during the Mercury program. Yeah, Mark, or pardon so, me, uh, Marty, what do you have? Yeah, so apparently it's, it's pre uh, cell phone days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is. This was pre everything. This was pre internet. This was pre uh, TikTok. Uh, this is the way it was done back then. Uh, here we have Gordon Cooper behind the wheel of a speedboat, probably uh, towing a skier, a water skier be uh, behind him. Uh, a picture of Alan Shepard. Uh, this, uh, as I've looked closely at it, looking at the bleachers back there, this appears to be the uh, old press site over on Cape Canaveral. And uh, Al getting into his uh, uh, car, getting ready to head out. This picture Ralph took of the uh, Mercury astronauts on Grand Bahama Island. And this was just after John Glenn's three-orbit flight on Friendship 7. And it, again, underscores the camaraderie of the... Uh, uh, Mercury 7. Uh, while they did have their differences about some things when it came to the flying, when it came to the important points of flight test operations, they were, they were all, to, all together. Now, I want to take a moment to uh, point out Alan Shepard in this picture and how he is dressed. And to give you a better idea, here's a close-up of Al coming out of the door. Here's a Navy, naval aviator, fighter pilot, test pilot, astronaut, wearing shorts, just above the knees. He's got a knobby set of knees. He's got black socks on, and he still manages to make the whole thing look cool. So that's Al Shepard on Grand Baham Island uh, uh, for the uh, return of John Glenn. Here's Gus Chrisom coming out of his home. This is uh, back when the guys were still quartered in Virginia. Uh, they were quartered, uh, the headquarters for the Space Task Group was in Langley, Virginia. So this is Gus coming out of his front door, probably wondering who's driving my Corvette. But you see Gus's Corvette there in the background. Uh, a great shot of Alan Shepard taken by Ralph Morse. This again at uh, uh, Shepard's home in uh, Virginia, the, the back uh, patio. Just a nice, relaxed, easygoing image. And this is the kind of thing that Ralph Morse was so good at capturing uh, when he was taking these uh, behind-the-scenes pictures, if you will, of the Mercury astronauts. Again, another angle of Al on his uh, back patio, sipping a nice cup of tea. This is uh, Gus Chrisman and Wally Shara arriving at Grand Bahama Island for uh, John Glenn's return. And, of course, today, whenever astronauts go anywhere, they're invariably wearing the brown, the uh, pardon me, the uh, blue flight suit. Back in those days, uh, if you saw the guys outside of work or even at work, it was in a Banlon shirt and a pair of go-to-hell pants and uh, just... Somebody said uh, these guys could could squeeze casual until it screamed for mercy. But uh, that's Gus and Wally arriving at uh, GBI. Now, this is a series of pictures that was taken by Ralph of Tom Stafford, John Young, and Gene Cernan. Uh, now, they were, of course, the crew for Apollo 10. But this set of pictures was taken while the guys were the backup crew for Apollo 7. Now, this was a barbecue, a cookout at John Young's house. And you see... Uh, Tom on the left, John Young in the middle, and uh, Gene Cernan on the, on the right. Here's Tom and Gene, who'd flown previously together on uh, Gemini 10 uh, at another event, probably the same location, but a different day. Gene Cernan and his uh, wife Barbara at the time, uh, sitting and relaxing uh, in the backyard of uh, John Young's house. Uh, this, again, points to the, the, the talent of Ralph Morse, that he was able to capture an image like this, which is something that certainly happens spontaneously. But this is uh, Gene Cernan with his young daughter, Tracy, at the barbecue. Um, and Gene uh, obviously appears to be comforting his, his daughter 
after uh, some mishap or brouhaha. But this, again, underscores, um, I think, the humanity of Ralph Morse's uh, work, uh, that he was able to capture moments like this uh, without interfering them, without having to stage them, but was able to catch the moment and express it and, and frame it so well. A close-up of uh, General Tom Stafford uh, getting ready to uh, have a, a hearty lunch at John Young's house. Uh, <laughs> I offer this picture without comment. That's Gene and Tom in the pool, and it's not exactly wiki watchy but then again, they're not exactly uh, bathing beauties. But there they are in uh, John's pool in the backyard. Now, this is John on board a boat that he had just built. It was... Uh, I think it was called the El Lago, I'm not sure. But uh, this was actually the first and last sailing of this boat because you're going to see in a moment that things didn't go well. Things went south quite quickly. And here we see the boat about to capsize. I don't know if Gene's doing this on purpose or not, but this boat is about to head for the briny deep. And sure enough, the El Lago down, uh, going to the bottom for its last voyage. Uh, Cernan claimed they struck an iceberg. I don't know, but... Uh, just some of the hijinks, some of the good times that Ralph Morse was able to capture, unlike any other uh, photographer. A little horseplay in the backyard, Gene Cernan, and of course in the back there, Tom Stafford and John Young on your right. A uh, great picture by Ralph Morse of Neil Armstrong, proving one of, the reasons, one of the reasons that Neil Armstrong was a great American, because he enjoyed a good cigar. Gordon Cooper proving that he, too, is a great American, cuddling his family cat in the backyard. Again, one of those great um, human moments that Ralph Morse could capture better than anyone else. I enjoy this picture. This is uh, when the guys were still quartered at Langley, Virginia, and their office, the astronaut office back in those days, was one room with seven government-issued steel desks. And uh, I look at this picture, and I, I think of Gordon Cooper saying to Alan Shepard, well, look who got the duty for the weekend. But uh, it looks like Gordon, Gordo's about to go out and have himself a good time while Al is stuck with, uh, with the, uh, the paperwork. If you look closely at Al's uh, left hand, you'll see him holding a cigarette and a carton of Salem's in front of him. Uh, all the guys of the original seven except one smoked. Uh, and... Even back then, NASA was telling the guys, look, if you're going to smoke, don't do it on camera. So they tried to, they tried to uh, suppress the tobacco thing as, as best they could. <laughs> this picture underscores the nature not only of Ralph Morris, but also of Alan Shepard. I'm sure at this point, the guys were lined up looking very solemn and very serious. And Ralph probably made the mistake of saying, smile, Al, and <laughs> this is what he got. But again, this is the kind of thing that um, Ralph Morris could bring out in these guys. He could bring out their fun side, their happy side. Um, John Glenn doesn't appear to be so sure about the whole thing, but Al Shepard seems to be having a good time here. This is uh, one of the first formal meetings of the first two groups of astronauts. And there you see Deke Slayton in the foreground. Deke at the time, of course, was the director of flight crew operations. And we're looking here at uh, the original seven and the next nine all gathered around the conference room. Someone who saw this picture said that it looked like a meeting of the Junior Chamber of Commerce. And I think that's a pretty uh, accurate description. Uh, I enjoy the picture. Everyone looks very somber, very serious. I especially like the look on Gus Grissom's face because Gus looks like he's got a hangover that would kill a horse. He's seated right behind uh, Alan Shepard on the right of your... Uh, of your screen you yeah yeah can you point that out there's Gus right there yeah it must have been a long night at least that's my guess this is a great picture that Ralph took of the uh, prime and backup crews of Apollo 1 uh, the prime crew Gus Grissom Ed White and Roger Chaffee on the right and the backup crew of Rusty Schweikert Jim McDivitt and uh, Dave Scott on the left uh, they're here at a house that they were borrowing uh, from uh, um, uh, one of their friends. Uh, this was uh, just outside of Los Angeles. And uh, this is when the guys were spending a lot of time at the uh, 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 North American uh, facility at Downey, California, as their uh, spacecraft was uh, being assembled. 
Gordon Cooper's wife, Trudy, was the only licensed pilot among the original seven wives. And here we see Gordo and Trudy taking the family airplane out for uh, uh, an afternoon spin. This is a little project at Deke Slayton's house. Uh, Deke and uh, Gus were neighbors, and Deke decided he was going to build a fence, and Gus came over to help him. So this was a series of pictures that uh, Ralph Morse took of that uh, uh, project in uh, Deke's backyard. There you see them with the post hole diggers, and then assembling the fence together. And there's Deke uh, shooting a plumb line along the uh, fence, making sure everything's uh, level. And then, of course, afterwards, it's uh, it's Miller time. Of course, I think that's probably a can of Carling Black Label in uh, Deke's hand. But the guys having come in from that day of working on the fence. And finally, again, another classic Ralph Morris picture, composition of uh, Deke and Gus relaxing. Uh, the cigar smoke in the picture actually adds to the, uh, I think, adds to the ambiance of the photo. But again, this was the kind of thing that Ralph Morris was so talented uh, in capturing and uh, expressing. These were the pictures that we were looking at in Life magazine when I was growing up. And these pictures, uh, just as much as the pictures of the guys in training and uh, on board the uh, spacecraft and so forth, these pictures really captured uh, my imagination because it really underscored the humanity of the human spaceflight program. Uh, you got to know these uh, these men uh, you felt you got to know these men quite well through these uh, photographs. And uh, it was just an incredible time. I don't think you'd ever see this sort of thing again, where the press would be allowed to go behind the scenes of an astronaut and their family and spend time with them as closely as the reporters of Life magazine and uh, uh, Ralph Morse were able to. It's just a remarkable, remarkable time. This is a photograph that Ralph took of the Apollo 7 crew shortly after they were named to uh, 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 take the helm after the loss of Grissom, White, and Chaffee on Pad 34. A uh, great picture. Wally Schra there on the bottom right. Uh, to the left is Don Isley, and up above is uh, Walt Cunningham. Great picture of Alan Shepard outside his hotel room at the Holiday Inn in Cocoa Beach. Uh, just after uh, uh, a nice long run on the beach. And again, one of those great uh, human interest pictures that uh, uh, really fleshed out, really kind of brought the life uh, to the Mercury program, that it was just more than rockets and technology. It was, uh, it was human beings. It was uh, 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 people who were not only risking their lives, but uh, not only loved what they were doing, but believed in what they were doing. And uh, just the humanity of a picture like this uh, really brings that point home. This too at the Holiday Inn, and don't worry, that is Marge Slayton, that is Deke's wife, uh, there by the poolside at uh, the Holiday Inn. But uh, uh, yeah, another another picture uh, kind of captured on the cuff by uh, uh, Ralph Morse. This was taken on Grand Bahama Island, and this was just after uh, Gus Grissom's flight on board Liberty Bell 7. You'll see Gus on the left side of the table wearing those dark glasses, and those glasses are to protect his eyesight from the light because he just had his pupils dilated as part of the post-flight medical exam. But again, you can see in this picture the uh, the camaraderie, the togetherness of the, uh, of the crew, and uh, how they're all there at uh, Grand Bahama Island uh, for the return of each astronaut as they uh, return from their uh, Earth orbital flights. Very rare picture here. This is Gordon Cooper and his family in the backyard having dinner and saying grace before uh, the dinner. Again, uh, a, a beautiful picture captured by uh, Ralph Morse. And again, you can't imagine today any reporter or any photographer being given this kind of access uh, to an astronaut or to an astronaut crew. This Gus Grissom uh, at the Holiday Inn, this is, uh, he's doing an, a post-flight interview after Gemini 3. Uh, and I don't know if you can see all the caption that I put on the picture, but the caption says, happiness is three orbits, a cold beer, and a cool watch. So this was Gus and uh, John Young with him at the uh, post-flight interview for Life Magazine at the Holiday Inn after Gemini 3.
beautiful picture again, a wonderful uh, touch of humanity. Neil Armstrong, his wife Jan, and their son uh, at the home in uh, in Texas. Now, this picture was taken of Cernan and Stafford uh, during the run-up to Apollo 10. And on this day, they had taken their daughters to a uh, nearby stable for uh, horseback riding. And I remember very distinctly that the caption on this picture was that uh, here Cernan and Stafford uh, contemplate life as cattle, cattle ranchers after their time at NASA. Well, Gene finally was a cattle rancher. In fact, he raised Texas long, Longhorns long after he, uh, he left NASA. As far as General Stafford is concerned, I think in this picture, he's probably thinking about that Senate seat in Oklahoma that's just about to open up. But uh, I, think, I don't think cattle, cattle ran ranching was on his mind at the time. This is part of the uh, coming home party for the Apollo 13 crew. On the left in shadow there are uh, Jim Lovell and Fred Hayes. And to the right in the blue sweater is Dr. Joe Kerwin. Uh, standing is uh, Charlie Duke. And seated there with his back partially to you is uh, Ken Mattingly. Again, this was uh, at Jim Lovell's home after the uh, return of the Apollo 13 crew. And I imagine that celebration probably stretched on into months, not just for the astronauts, but for the flight controllers and for everyone involved in support of that uh, of that mission. Gus Grissom had a small lake uh, in back of his house, and here he is feeding some of the uh, uh, waterfowl there. And uh, just like anything else, once you start to feed a bunch of animals, if you run out of food, that's not going to stop him because here's Gus is being followed by one of them and he's run out of food and the duck is saying, hey, come back here, fellow. We're not finished. Al Shepard uh, leading the crew here. There's uh, Scott Carpenter and then Deke Slayton and Gus Grissom. Uh, this is probably in Washington, D.C. They're probably on their way to some official hearing or meeting and in all likelihood, they're probably discussing the nature of one or two of the participants in this meeting on the political side. Gus Grissom coming out of his room at the Holiday Inn in Cocoa Beach. And uh, a lot of people talk about the, um, about the glamorous life of an astronaut, but you were literally on the go. You were uh, uh, going to training sessions. You were going to morale tours. You're going across the country to inspect hardware as it was built and tested. Uh, and there really was a lot of lost family time uh, in that career. Still is, as a matter of fact. Uh, the astronauts who uh, uh, live on board the International Space Station, they're involved in training for the better part of two and a half, sometimes three years, traveling all around the world. And so uh, a lot of family time is lost in this business, and not just for astronauts, but for uh flight controllers as well. Uh, one of the flight controllers on Apollo 11, uh, Bob Carlton, was asked one time, if you could do it all over again, would you do it? And Bob said, no. He said, I lost too much time with my family. I didn't get to see my kids grow up. So he said, no, I wouldn't do it again. And finally, this picture taken, uh, as a matter of fact, at the same uh, press conference, uh, it's the one that Al Shepard made the big smiling face at. And here you see Alan Shepard and uh, Scott Carpenter as uh, Scott makes uh, some point. Now, we're talking about uh, these stories behind the scenes with uh, uh, Ralph Morris and the Mercury astronauts and the uh, unique nature of the life of an astronaut back in those days. Well, part of that unique nature was an automobile known as the Chevrolet Corvette. Now, the Corvette came to be known as America's sports car, and it was this publicity with Mercury and other astronauts that, that I think made that possible. Uh, this is Alan Shepard uh, on the hood of the, a brand new Corvette he's just received. We'll tell you the story about that shortly. But this whole idea of Corvettes with astronauts came, uh, on, uh, came about uh, by the uh, work of a gentleman by the name of Jim Rathman. Now, Jim was not only a Chevrolet dealer, but Jim was also a winner of the Indianapolis 500. So he definitely knew cars. 
And when an opening came up for a GM dealership in Florida, there were two openings, as a matter of fact. One was in Miami Beach, and the other was in Melbourne, Florida. And uh, Jim made his choice, and he decided to go ahead and take the, the dealership in Melbourne. And people kind of shook their heads. You know, why would you want Melbourne? It's just a backwater filled with mosquitoes and rattlesnakes, while Miami Beach is where all the action is happening. Well, Rathman knew what was coming. The space program was coming, and with it uh, were going to be coming astronauts, test pilots. And Rathman knew that astronauts needed cars like cars needed astronauts, and he was going to be ready. So when the Mercury 7 did get to uh, Florida, uh, Rathman was able to establish a genuine relationship with them. They were all members of what I call the Go Fast Club. So uh, they got along quite well, and Jim drew up agreements with the original seven that they could lease a Corvette from his dealership for a dollar a year. And at the end of the year, they could either renew the lease or they could get a fresh one and start all over again. So these Corvettes were involved in a lot of the history out on Cape Canaveral, and it's history that you'll seldom find in any of the, uh, of the history books. Now, among the original seven astronauts, the Corvette drivers were Alan Shepard, Gus Grissom, and Gordon Cooper. Wally Schirra had a Maserati. Scott Carpenter had a Shelby Cobra, which was a genuine racing, which was a real racing car. I can't recall what Deke Slayton was driving, uh, but I know that John Glenn had that famous old beat-up Peugeot. So among the uh, astronauts, Shepard, uh, Grissom, and Cooper had the Mm, Titus rivalry, I guess, as far as fast cars was concerned, since they all owned Corvettes. And uh, these races were very famous in the back, uh, back streets of, of Cape Canaveral. Now, one of the original stories was that when Alan Shepard was training for Freedom 7, he was involved in some, pat some testing out at the launch pad inside the spacecraft on top of the rocket. And that testing went from 12 noon until about 11 o'clock that night. So when the testing was over, Shepard and the technicians went back to Hangar Rest, where we had the crew quarters and the, the bunk beds. And one of the people in that group was one of our program managers, Walt Williams. So as they got to Hangar Rest, Walt told Alan Shepard, he says, you know, Al, he says, I can't sleep on those bunks upstairs. They kill my back. I can't sleep. And I got a very important meeting tomorrow morning. Shepard said, no problem. Here, take the keys to my Corvette, use my room at the Holiday Inn, and Cocoa Beach and get a good night's sleep. I'll see you in the morning. So Williams jumped into the Corvette and roared off into the night. As soon as Williams was out of sight, Shepard picked up the telephone and he said, this is Alan Shepard. I want to report my car. It's just been stolen. And when Williams got out to gate one, there was air police. There were state troopers all waiting with their weapons over the hoods, waiting for this uh, stolen Corvette. So these Corvettes, as I say, were uh, part of the uh, legend out here at Cape Canaveral during the Mercury days. We'll show you some, share some more stories with you here shortly. Let's go to this picture. Uh, Alan Shepard had his Corvette uh, before his first flight, but this was a Corvette that he received after his uh, Freedom 7 flight in May of 1961. And the GM Big Shots wanted to make the most of this, so they presented the car to him. But of course, Rathman was a guy who'd been supplying the guys all along. But the GM leadership wanted their name in the game, and so here they are presenting a brand new uh, Corvette to Alan Shepard after his Mercury uh, uh, Mer Mercury flight. And you'll see in other pictures, Al previously owned a, a ragtop, a convertible Corvette. This is a famous picture of the Apollo 15 crew with their Corvettes very distinctively uh, painted. And in front of them is the lunar roving vehicle that they were going to drive on the moon for the first time on the mission of Apollo 15. Now, I believe that this photograph was fairly off the cuff, kind of, it was thought up fairly quickly. And again, it, it might have been Ralph Morse's idea to do this because Ralph took the picture. But the guys had their Corvettes there and they were out at the training area just behind the uh, flight crew training building here at KSC. And uh, it was a natural idea. Go ahead and line up your Corvettes in front of the rover and let's take a picture, which they did. Well, NASA came back at the crew afterwards and said that was really not a very good idea because, you know, Congress is already looking at things like these deals with the Corvettes 
and the life uh, 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 contract and so forth. And they're just watching for a reason to come down on any of this stuff. So, you know, let's try to cool it with the uh, mention of the Corvettes. But uh, again, this was uh, one of the classic pictures during the Apollo program and the, uh, the beautiful three Corvettes owned by uh, the Apollo 15 crew. And looking from left to right is there's Jim Irwin in the center is Al Warden, and to the right is Mission Commander Dave Scott. The Apollo 12 crew and their Corvettes uh, at Patrick Air Force Base, uh, these Corvettes uh, painted uh, in uh, navy blue and gold and uh, small red, white, and blue tags on the uh, left uh, front fender. And a friend of mine, Dale Metz, who was a uh, uh, firefighter out at KSC during the Apollo program, told me of the time when he saw these three Corvettes uh, coming over the bridge, which led from Cape Canaveral to KSC proper, Merritt Island. And he saw them shoot over the bridge and get airborne one at a time. Boom, boom, boom. And over the bridge they went and uh, on to uh, Merritt Island. So again, these uh, Corvette races, if you will, were uh, part of the landscape back during the uh, early days of the space program. Here's Al Shepard at the Holiday Inn uh, with the uh, other Corvette that he had originally with the uh, rag top. And there he is getting his uh, luggage out of the trunk. Uh, Al talking to a friend about the engine in his uh, Corvette. All these guys were, as I say, members of the Go Fast Club. They loved anything that went fast, whether they were airplanes or uh, uh, automobiles or uh, or what have you. Uh, Alan Shepard, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but uh, Alan Shepard was uh, the target of a gotcha that he never, never knew about. We'll tell you about that in a sec. Here's Gus Grissom and his son, uh, Mark, uh, with their uh, with uh, Gus's Corvette. Again, I believe this is in uh, Langley, uh, uh, Virginia. Gus Grissom was part of the Corvette legend in that he and Jim Rathman had taken a Corvette for a test drive out on Cape Canaveral one night, and they were approaching a notorious hairpin curve, and Jim saw his chance to set the hook. So he told Gus, he said, you know, he says, Wally says he can take this curve at 35 miles an hour, and I can only do it at 30. Must be that Italian car of his. And Gus said, pull over. So they pulled over, and Gus got behind the wheel. Gus gunned the engine full speed, headed for the curve. The car spun out, actually swapped ends, and landed in the water. Well, Gus is cussing his head off. Jim Rathman is laughing like hell. And they managed to sneak a tow truck onto the base and pull the thing out of the water. And they hid it in a hangar out there at the Cape until the coast was clear and they could finally sneak it off the, um, off the property. Now, after Gus's flight on Liberty Bell 7, about a week or two afterwards, he called Jim Rathman. And he said, hey, he said, meet me at Patrick Air Force Base. We're going to take a flight in an F-102. So, of course, Rathman loved anything that had to do with speed. So he said, yeah, I'll be there. So they take the 102 out, and they're flying out over the uh, ocean. And, of course, Rathman, being a, being a go-fast guy, said, well, let's see what this airplane can do. So Gus starts to go into all these maneuvers, a high yo-yos, split S's, Cuban 8's, everything in the book. And he can see Rathman in the back seat. And with each maneuver, Rathman is getting sicker and sicker and sicker, and his face is turning greener and greener. And finally, just before he's getting ready to throw up, Gus brings the aircraft straight and level. So he gives Jim a little time to recuperate, relax, and get his senses back. And once he sees he's recovered, he uncorks the airplane again, split S's, Cuban 8's, every maneuver in the book. And I think he did this about three or four times just to get even for that business with a Corvette landing in the water on uh, Cape Canaveral. Another picture of Gus and uh, uh, Mark and uh, his Corvette at uh, Langley. Gordon Cooper and his 1965 Corvette Stingray. Now, I mentioned earlier that Alan Shepard was the victim of a gotcha that he never, ever knew about. And it, it went like this. Cooper and Shepard would have these drag races in back roads of the, uh, of the Cape. And it seemed Shepard was always losing. And whenever he lost, Shepard would take his car back to Jim Rathman and said, look, 
The car doesn't have the performance that I need. It doesn't have the pickup. He said, fix the thing. Get it straightened out. So after a couple of days, Shepard would pick up the car and he'd race Cooper and Cooper would win again, this time by a wider margin. And these margins of victory got wider and wider and wider until finally, without a word being spoken, the races ended. Well, it wasn't until Alan Shepard's memorial ceremony uh, for his funeral that the truth came out. Gordon Cooper gave his eulogy for Alan Shepard. He talked about all the things they'd been through together, all the things they'd accomplished, all the grief with the doctors and the rigors of spaceflight training and everything. And he talked about how that had cemented their friendship. And then Cooper went on to say that he did have some regrets he said, I do have to apologize to you, for all those Corvette races that I won. And I have to tell you, it wasn't because I was a good driver. I just cheated on you a little bit. And he went on to explain that every time they had a race and Shepard took his car back to Jim Rathman, Jim Rathman would adjust the differential and the timing chain and other pieces that would lower the performance on Shepard's car. And so every time Shepard went back to race Cooper, Cooper would win by larger and larger margins because Rathman was dropping the performance of the car a step at a time with every visit. So that was the one uh, gotcha that was ever gotten over on Alan Shepard. Uh, Shepard was the kind of guy who he could play a joke with the best of them. But if you, if you hit him with a gotcha, you could count on something happening to you maybe four or five times worse downstream. But he never found out about this. Uh, I sometimes wonder if that night there wasn't a hell of a thunder and electrical storm in the sky when uh, when Cooper went home to go to bed. Buzz Aldrin at the flight crew training building during the run-up for Apollo 11 and his Corvette there in the uh, parking lot of flight crew. Beautiful car here. This is Gus Grissom's 1967 Corvette. Now, Gus took delivery on this Corvette from Jim Rathman shortly before he was killed in the Apollo 1 fire. And, of course, this was a car that he was leasing for a dollar a year. But uh, after Gus was killed, Jim Rathman, being Jim Rathman, he bought, it, he bought the car back from uh, Gus's widow, Betty, and he paid her full price for it. But this car was um, uh, bought by uh, a technician who worked out on Kennedy Space Center, and his plan was he was going to refurbish it and upgrade it and juice it up and take it out on the car racing circuit. Well, luckily, that never happened. Another fellow came along and bought that car from him, and he restored the Corvette to its uh, former glory. And in fact, he contacted General Motors after he finished the restoration. GM came out and inspected it, and, he gave, and they gave the guy a 98% on his restoration of Gus Grissom's car. It's a beautiful, beautiful car. And it continues. Uh, this is uh, Scott Carpenter not too many uh, years ago in a parade in Cocoa Beach, uh, riding in a uh, vintage Corvette of the 1960s era and his uh, daughter uh, uh, there in the uh, passenger seat. Edgar Mitchell in a Corvette from the uh, early 1970s, which was when he was the lunar module pilot on board Apollo 14. This at the same parade in Cocoa Beach, Florida. Maybe it's Grant Frank. Yeah, back there. Let's take a look at that. Yeah, there it is. Sure enough. Local landmark. Yeah, but I think the famous glass bank. We need to mention that. What's, What's that, that now? We, I did, <laughs> you didn't mention the, the name of the the building behind the Corvette. Okay. It's the, it's the famous glass bank. The glass bank. Right. Okay. The glass bank. There it is. And uh, more recently, well, actually in the same parade, but a more recent Corvette and uh, astronaut Susan Kilrain uh, in a Corvette from the uh, 1980s. A uh, beautiful car, canary yellow, as many of them were back in the uh, 1980s. Susan was the pilot on STS-83 uh, and STS-94. Now that's kind of a run-up of some of the things we want to talk about today, the great Ralph Morris and the uh, love affair between astronauts and uh, Corvettes. Um, it's been fascinating talking to the astronauts themselves about the uh, 
the whole history of the uh, uh, involvement with uh, people like Jim Rathman, uh, people like Rathman, people like Leo Dorsey, who was an attorney for, uh, who worked for Life Magazine, who provided his services free of charge. Back in those days, these are people who simply wanted to be part and simply wanted to, uh, to help with the space program, offering these things, not expecting anything really in return, but uh, helping to lay the groundwork for a lot of uh, incredible history that we know uh, uh, for the manned space program. And Marty, did we have a question waiting for us? Yeah, Nick, we have a question from Gary Jarrell. Nick, are there any of the Corvettes still around? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, we had Neil Armstrong's Corvette out at Kennedy Space Center on display for some time. Alan Shepard's Corvette was on display with the American Space Museum back when the museum was located at the uh, at the Toddsville Mall. Uh, let's see, who else is... Uh, Alan Bean's uh, uh, Corvette is still out there. And these Corvettes have all been uh, refurbished and brought to their former... Uh, their former glory. I can recall the pictures I saw of Neil Armstrong's uh, Corvette, and it had been fairly badly abused, if you will. But the person who ended up with it restored it and had it looking as good as uh, Gus Grissom's that you see uh, right here. So the Corvettes from some of the classic guys are, are still out there, fetching a very good price, I might add. As I recall, Gus's Corvette sold for about $275,000. We enjoyed especially uh, going through the uh, photographs, uh, the collection of uh, Ralph Morris. And since I've had the privilege of uh, meeting a number of uh, fine photographers, Carlton Bailey, for example, who I got to spend a lot of time with during the uh, space shuttle program, um, the art of the uh, work of people like Carlton Bailey, Ralph Morris, the USAC brothers, and people like that. It's really, really quite remarkable. And so much more goes into this job of photography than setting up a camera and pushing a, a shutter. Uh, lots of work goes into it, a lot of research. I can recall one story when some uh, automatic cameras were set up around launch complex 17 for a Delta launch, an unmanned launch of a Delta rocket. And the photographers went out there the day before, set up their cameras, and they had devices on the cameras where the sound would trigger the shutter. So the roar of the engine would start the camera, would hammer all the frames. So the uh, the countdown was, the, the launch was scrubbed that night. And so the next day, the guys went out there to get their cameras, and one guy discovered that all 36 frames of his camera had been exposed. And he came to realize that the sound of the all clear claxton, the horn out of the launch pad, when it was clear for the crew to come out of the blockhouse, that horn had set off his sound detector and uh, triggered all 36 frames of his camera. Well, he took the film back to be developed, figuring he was just gonna get all these static pictures of a Delta standing on the launch pad in the night. And sure enough, the first five or six frames, you saw the Delta just standing there in the floodlights. In the sixth or seventh frame, a Florida panther walked into the picture. On the following frame, the panther turned and looked directly at the lens. So this guy got an outstanding picture of a Florida panther with a rocket in the background, and he ended up selling that picture to more wildlife journals than you could st uh, shake a stick at. And I can remember out at press side, he gave a copy of the, uh, of the picture, a large copy of the picture in a frame to the the crew at the press site. So these were some of the things that you could uh, uh, find yourself uh, lucking into uh, when you were a photographer out here. Uh, I had the opportunity throughout the years to go out to a number of mission events, both with hardware and with astronauts, and to be able to take some, uh, some memorable pictures. And out of all the pictures I've taken out there, I think the one that stands in my mind, stands out in my mind, was a picture that I'd gotten of Fred Gregory at the runway of the shuttle landing facility when he and his uh, crew for STS-33 had come into town. And Fred's got his flight plan, his flight data file under his arm, and he's got a big smile on his face and throwing a big wave to the photographers. And uh, it was, uh, I suppose it was as close as I'll ever get to a Ralph Morse picture. But uh, I really cherished, I really cherished that picture. I shared it with Fred. 
and uh, it's one of my favorites. And I try to use it whenever whenever I can in uh, any uh, public presentations. Uh, being able to track this history through a camera lens is really, really exciting. And when you come back at the end of the day and you look at the product that you've been able to, uh, to capture, it's very gratifying. And sometimes the lighting angles just work right. The people in the picture work out just right, the hardware or whatever. And sometimes once in a while you catch the proverbial uh, lightning in a bottle and come up with a uh, nice picture. And I've been privileged to do that. Uh, Nick, I think you need to bring that picture of Fred Gregory in next time you, you're on our show. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, we could do a picture of uh, some of the studies that I've gotten out there of some of the astronauts. But yeah, definitely that one with... Uh, with Fred, uh, uh, you'll enjoy. Um, I can remember one that I got of Susan Kilrain surrounded by a group of, uh, I think there were fourth or fifth graders, and the kids are just rambunctious and happy and having a good time, and Susan just got this big smile on her face. Uh, like I say, it's just some of those moments you get to catch out there. And one picture that I did try to find for my Corvette discussion today and I couldn't find it. It's buried deep somewhere in the files. I have to keep looking. We had a Corvette parade for a number of the astronauts at the Space Center, and one of them was John Glenn. And John rode on the top of the back seat, or the, the top of the seats, the, the aft part of the Corvette with his legs in the cockpit. And Al Warden was driving the Corvette. Well, Al Warden used to race Corvettes. And this picture that I have, they're, ta they're taking a turn, and it's not really a lot of speed, but you can see John is kind of leaning with the G as uh, Al comes around that turn, and Al had a chance to uh, open it up just a fraction of the way, and, and uh, I, I got that good picture. I'll have to go back and, uh, and find it. Um, I was privileged as I was growing up. My father had... Uh, Corvettes uh, starting, I think, in 1961, and I got to drive uh, a number of them, and it is a remarkable automobile. The first thing, my the two things my father warned me about with the Corvette. Number one, be careful because the car can get away from you before you know it because it's just that good at going fast. And the other thing he warned me about was that the racing stripe he had painted on the side of the Corvette made that car do 35 miles an hour when it was sitting in a parking spot. So the Corvette was definitely, and I do have the distinction of getting two speeding tickets in two weeks. And the second speeding ticket on Riverside Drive, the cops pulled me over. And as they were writing me up, the cop said, were you driving this car out on uh, Highway 40 last week? I said, yeah, I was. He said, yeah, we talked to the guys about that. They didn't think a car could go that fast. I said, gee, yeah, thank you for the compliment. I appreciate that. But it was, it was not a good day. But uh, what a remarkable car. What a great car and what a joy to drive. And uh, you did. You just felt the car was a part of you uh, when you were driving it. And it was easy to make that autom automobile go fast. Um, on the other hand, friends of mine said, what good is a fiberglass car with no storage space? I said, well, you have to drive it to find out. But uh, then years later, actually years later, I became a Mustang guy. I drove a Mustang for a long time. I really fell in love with that car. And in fact, I think if you look around the Space Coast, you probably see more Mustangs than you do Corvettes. But still, they're out there. Winston Scott, uh, let's see, who else? Uh, Walt Cunningham, John McBride. Uh, several of the guys went on to get Corvettes. Of course, they weren't for a dollar a year, but still, if you're an astronaut and you can swing it, that's definitely the way to go. Marty, what else do we have out there today? That's it, Nick. Any questions, comments? No, sir. Anyone care for a mint? <laughs> well, we want to take this opportunity to thank you all very much for coming by and joining us on uh, Stay Curious today. Again, we want to say hello to uh, uh, Mark and his mom out there in the uh, uh, the wilds of uh, of Ohio. And uh, we also want to take a chance to quickly say hello to some friends of ours, um, Bill and Tammy, uh, Carlton Bailey. Uh, my brother Pat is out there. Astronauts Roger Crouch, Terry Wilcutt, and Tom Jones. 
And also, uh, out there on the net today, we've got Doug Forrest, Gary Gerald, Tom Usiak, Dave Stangy, and uh, and his granddaughter. Very good. Excellent. Well, a new generation joining Stay Curious. That's, uh, that's great. We also want to, once again, pay tribute to our friend. <laughs> I, I flat mark. I saw this on the table when I walked in. I said, oh, my God, bring me the head of Mark Marquette. But, uh, yeah, we want to again say hello to Mark and hope you're having a good time. Hope you had a good view of that um, of that eclipse and hope you're having a, a good time and wish you and your, your mom all the best. So, in the meantime, from myself and from our producer, Marty Winkle, we want to again say thank you very much for joining us today. We hope you've enjoyed the presentation. We hope to see you back here again. Don't forget uh, Shuttle Fest 3 coming up this Saturday here in Titusville. Uh, we thank you all very much for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you again real soon. Thanks very much.